But thank you for joining us today as we continue our series, Questioning Christianity. Questioning Christianity. We're kind of doing this series where we're asking some difficult questions, maybe some questions you haven't even thought about before, about our faith, right? And so today what I want to do is start off by asking you a question, all right? I want you to be honest with me. If you could participate and raise your hand, that would be great. But has anybody here ever had their heart broken? Anyone had their heart broken? Okay, yeah, almost everyone, right? Everyone has had their heart broken. Now, as difficult as that pain was or may still be, let me ask you a question. When you had your heart broken, did anybody call 911? Did anyone rush you to the hospital? Did an ambulance come and get you? Did someone attempt CPR on you? Did you have to have surgery to repair your broken heart? No. Of course not. Why? Because when I said, was your heart ever broken, you knew I wasn't talking literally. You knew what I meant about a metaphorical brokenness in your heart and emotions that wasn't real. But what if someone right now was having a heart attack and you called 911 and you're talking to the operator? Do you think the operator would say, oh, I am so sorry to hear about your heart? This is what you should do. Hold them really close. Listen to them. Let them know, right? They wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't the operator do that? Because all of us on a daily basis depend on distinguishing between literal truth and a metaphor. That's just how life is. There's literal truths and there's metaphors. I was at the playground the other day with my kids and I heard a mom say, oh, if she does it again, I'm going to kill him. Now, should I call the police? and report her for intent to murder someone, right? Or was she expressing her frustrations in extreme language? Have you ever, has ever, someone ever told you, I, I just died of embarrassment? You should be like, wow, you rose from the dead? That's amazing, right? But if that same person said, because of what happened, I'm contemplating suicide, you would immediately take them serious and get them help. Right? Why is that? Because both literal and figurative language can accurately describe our reality. Both can be true, and on a daily basis, we're distinguishing between literal and metaphorical things. We can tell lies with the literal words, and we can tell truth through metaphors. Which brings me to our question we're going to talk about today. How can you take the Bible literally? How can you take the Bible literally? I've literally, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard people ask this question, but people say things like this. How can you take the Bible literally? It doesn't really mean that. Do you think God really meant that? And there's so many metaphors in the Bible that people try to argue that the Bible isn't meant to be taken literally. They might try to point out certain metaphors, certain things that are hard to explain, and then, therefore, they could kind of do whatever they want, because you're not supposed to take it literally, and so they could kind of sidestep any difficult issues and do whatever they want to do. What they're doing, they're trying to undermine God's authoritative word. They're trying to say we don't have to completely listen to God's word. It might be good advice. There might be some great stories, but it's okay if you don't listen to it. And what we have to understand about metaphors is it's not that metaphors make the Bible unreliable or untrue. Metaphors actually highlight truth, and they help us to understand truth better. Just because there are both metaphors and literal truths in the Bible doesn't negate its authority. Why? Because the truth is we find metaphors memorable, persuasive, and moving. Metaphors ignite our imagination. They connect us with other people, and they connect us with the truth being shared. It's kind of like an inside joke with a friend, or a special language you share with somebody. There's a unique connection like that. Let me give you an example. 
my four-year-old Faith. She is goofy and funny and silly. And she will run up to me and she'll just be speaking gibberish. She'll be like, blah, 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 speaking gibberish. And she'll try to motion what she wants me to do, like give her a drink, you know? So I, so I, I pretend like I understand this gibberish and I gibberish speak back to her and I give her a drink. And so throughout the course of this goofing around, uh, we eventually created our own special word. It's a made up word. You wouldn't be able to guess it because it's so goofy, but we both know what this word means. In fact, just the other night I was putting her to bed and I was saying, hey, Faithy, I'm going to talk about our special word. Don't worry, I'm not going to share it. But I just want to be clear. What does our word mean? And she stopped goofing around, looked me dead in the eyes, and we said it at the same time with each other. It says, I love you with my whole heart. Whenever I say this word to her, we both know it means I love you with my whole heart. Now, what's my point of that story besides it's absurdly cute, am I right? Um, my point is this. Does the fact that that word isn't a literal word in Webster's Dictionary, the fact that it's a made-up, goofy word between us, does it take away from our affection for each other, or does it do the complete opposite? Does it highlight it, and does it enhance and become more memorable between me and her? And it's the same thing with metaphors in the Bible. Why do you think poetry uses so many metaphors? How come the songs we sing have so many metaphors? Because it highlights and enhances truths that we know are true. It's the same thing with the Bible. These youths of metaphors in the Bible are not an embarrassment to the Bible. It's not a flaw or something that diminishes its power. The use of a metaphor is a part of its life-changing power. And so my goal this morning is not to show us that the Bible, or my goal this morning is to show us that the Bible's truths are highlighted and better explained be, because of the use of metaphors. Metaphors don't neg negate the truth of God's word. They actually help us to understand it better. People say the Bible is full of metaphors, so how could you take it literally? They can navigate any challenging scriptures because we don't have to take them literally. Yes, the Bible is full of metaphors, and they're amazing, but they don't take away from the Bible's truth or its authority. They add to it, helping us to better understand God's word and God's way. The fact that the Bible raises questions and makes you think doesn't make it a bad book, okay? It actually makes it a great book, right? It's crazy when there's all these questions you have and you think, it's a, no, it's a great book. Isn't that what literature does? Doesn't literature make you think? Doesn't literature make you try to understand? It makes you go deeper in life? The Bible provides more answers to what humans really want to know than any other book ever written. The Bible answers some of life's greatest questions. For example, where did we come from? What is our purpose in life? Where are we going? The meaning of life, the nature of good and evil, and who is God and how does he relate to us? What is my point? My point is all these metaphors in the Bible only make it an even better book. How can you take the Bible literally? Because there's truth in it. And the metaphors help us understand truth better. And so what I want to do today is I want to look at one specific story about Jesus and I want to look at one specific metaphor Jesus uses and how it applies to us. The story we're going to look at today is found in John chapter 3. We're going to read the first four verses, but we're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to stop after it, and we're going to slowly dissect to really feel what's happening in this passage. John chapter 3, verse 1 says this, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, who was a Pharisee. Now I want to stop here and I want us to know just from this verse and some other details, we know three things about this man, Nicodemus. The first thing we know is this, that he was a Pharisee. It says he was a Pharisee. A Pharisee was a group of people who were dedicated their entire lives to strictly following every detail of God's law. They memorized and followed every single detail in an effort to please God. The religious activity, the things they did, were all to please God. They wanted to please and honor God. They wanted to prove they were good people to God. Why does this matter? This matters because the Pharisees constantly fought with Jesus. 
They fought with Jesus because they thought Jesus was not sent by God. But yet their whole life they're trying to please God. The second thing we know about this man, Nicodemus, we know he was very influential. The reason we know that is because it says he was a Jewish leader. What that actually means is he was on something called the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was actually like a supreme court for the Jews. So he's like on the supreme court in this religious sense. And one of the jobs of the Sanhedrin was to confront anybody who claimed to be a Messiah and shut him down. The Sanhedrin's job was to find people who claimed to be sent from God and find out if they weren't true. And so Nicodemus, a Pharisee who fought with Jesus, who didn't believe Jesus was a real Messiah, now he's on the Sanhedrin. There's no way this Nicodemus guy would be friends with Jesus. The third thing we know about Nicodemus, this is very interesting, is that he was a very wealthy person. We know he was very wealthy. Why? Because at the end of the Gospel of John, we're going to fast forward to the end. You can see that out here. John 19, 39 says this. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. So you're going to see Nicodemus met with Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment and made from, made from myrrh and aloes. Now I looked up how much it would cost for someone to buy that much ointment. And in today's dollars, somebody, I don't know how they figure this stuff out, estimated that it's $200,000 worth of these aloes and ointments. That means he was a very wealthy man. And back then, a very wealthy man of his stature would never meet with a poor traveling preacher like uh, Jesus. And so we know about Nicodemus. He's this Pharisee against Jesus. He's on the Sanhedrin. They try to stop people who claim to be the Messiah. And he's very wealthy. Now we're going to pick up back to the story in verse 2. Now we know who this Nicodemus is, right? Verse 2. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miracle, miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Now I want you to think about this. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. There are probably two main reasons he came at night. The first was, we kind of covered it in the first section here. Uh, he kind of has all these cautions about Jesus. He's not sure about Jesus. He's on the Sanhedrin. He shouldn't be friends with Jesus. And there's a lot of drama around Jesus. And so he probably didn't want to get caught up in the drama. But the second reason to me is very interesting to me. Rabbis used to say the best time to study God's word and the law was at night because you wouldn't be distracted by the busyness of the day. And if you think about Jesus, he was always surrounded by people. There was always crowds around Jesus. And so I kind of wonder if maybe Nicodemus was searching for something. Maybe Nicodemus wanted an answer. It wasn't like those other Pharisees who tried to trick Jesus and try to ask him questions to get in trouble. I wonder if Nicodemus needed needed a moment at night to ask Jesus what really was going on. And maybe he was searching for something. And so here's the metaphor. I know it took me forever to get here. Here's the metaphor in verses 3 and 4. It says this. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? It's interesting, first of all, to note that Nicodemus goes, we know you're sent from God because of all the miracles you do. And Jesus doesn't even respond to that. Jesus tells him the most important thing. More important than Jesus' miracles, more important than Jesus' healings, more important than all the signs and wonders that Jesus did, Jesus pointed Nicodemus to the most important thing. Why is this important? Because Pharisees always wanted to find the most important law. They wanted to be the most important. They wanted to be the most holy. And Jesus goes, let me tell you the most important thing. The most important thing is that you're born again. The most important thing in your life is that you could be born again. And Nicodemus didn't like this answer. He goes, what do you mean born again? How could you go back into your mother's womb? Which I find very interesting for Nicodemus because this language, this kind of metaphor, it wasn't new to Jews. Jews understood this. When you converted to Judaism, they said you were like a newborn child. You were like a child who had a rebirth. So Nicodemus kind of understood this language. So why was he rejecting what Jesus was saying to him? And I wonder... If Nicodemus' life experiences had something to do with this. 
I wonder if it's because he spent his whole life searching every single law, obeying every single law, studying every single law, devoting his life to pleasing God, yet he never felt like he achieved it. I mean, there were no better people than the Pharisees, no more more religious, no one more devoted, no one more disciplined, yet something was still missing in his life. Nicodemus tried almost everything, and nothing gave him the new life he was searching for. And now Jesus says, all you need, the most important thing, the thing you've been searching for, the thing you've been looking for in the law, and looking for in your rituals, and looking for in how you lived your life, the most important thing is to be born again. And Nicodemus goes, what are you talking about? That's impossible. And maybe some of you feel kind of like Nicodemus did. You feel like that. You've tried everything. You've worked hard. Maybe you've developed good habits. And you're healthy and you eat right and you work out. Maybe you work hard at your job and you make a lot of money and you could buy nice things. Maybe it was something different. Maybe you tried in relationships and that didn't work out. Maybe you tried in drugs and that didn't work out. Maybe you discovered something else and nothing in life really makes you happy. Nothing in life really brings that purpose and that thing you've been searching for. Maybe you feel like Nicodemus. Sure, it'd be great if I could start over. Sure, it'd be great if I could get a second chance. Sure, it'd be great if I could get a new life. But it's too late for me. I can't go back in my mother's, my mother's womb. I can't become a new person. I can't be born again. It's too late. I've tried everything and nothing works. But I'm here to tell you this morning that it's not too late for you. And it's not too late to find what you're searching for. Because it's right in front of you. His name is Jesus. In fact, in just a couple verses, Jesus says some of the most famous verses in the Bible. John 3, 16, he says, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God sent his Son that you could be saved. God loved you so much that he gave up his most prized possession so anyone who believes in Jesus will have eternal life. It's not anyone who does good enough. It's not anyone who does enough good deeds. It's not anyone who works hard enough. It's not anyone who has a good life. It's not anyone who gives a lot of money. It's not anyone who says a lot of prayers. It's anyone who believes. Ephesians says it like this, it's only by grace through faith that you're saved. Salvation is not a reward. You can't boast about it. You can't earn it. But it's a gift from God. It might be the very thing that Nicodemus was searching for wasn't something he had to do, but it was actually something that Jesus was going to do for him. And today, if you've been searching, if you've been wondering, if you've been feeling like there's something missing in your life, it's possible that that's actually the Holy Spirit leading you to Jesus. See, it's not another task to do. It's not another ritual to perform. This isn't another prayer to say or anything you could do. It's only through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ that we could be made whole, that we could be made spiritually new, that we could be, in the words of Jesus, born again. Born again is a metaphor for salvation, It's a metaphor for the forgiveness of your sins and a new spiritual life that you get through Jesus Christ when you believe. It's a truth told through metaphor. It doesn't negate its power. It actually enhances it because it's so powerful the way you think about being born again. Here's a great scripture talking about it. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says it like this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. 
That Greek word new is kenos, and it means different from the one that was existed before. It's not just a new as in an updated model or a fresh start. It's a totally different life because you aren't your old life. The old life is gone, and a new, a different life than the one you were living before has begun. When you come to Christ, you are not reformed, rehabilitated, or re-educated. You're actually recreated into a new person. It's taking that which was spiritually dead and bringing it back to life. It's not turning over a new leaf. It's beginning a new life. It's not a superficial feeling. It's actually a supernatural transformation and freeing in your life. This isn't positive affirmation. This is called spiritual transformation. And you ask, how is this possible? It's possible because God loved the world so much that he gave his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for us that we could be born again. That we could be forgiven. Do these metaphors negate God's truth? Do they make them any less true, any less powerful? Or do this metaphor bring life and understanding and connect with us in an even better way? In fact, there are seven metaphors Jesus uses to describe himself. Seven metaphors Jesus uses to describe himself. And these seven metaphors are known as the I am statements of Jesus. And what I want you to do is just for a moment, I want you to listen to how beautiful these metaphors are. I want you to think of the meaning behind the metaphors. I want you to see who Jesus is. And for some of you today, it's going to be time to be born again like Nicodemus. It's going to be time to give your life to Jesus because of all the things that Jesus is. Seven things Jesus said about himself. Seven metaphors Jesus uses to describe himself. Seven things that will help us understand who he is better. Number one, Jesus said this. He goes, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. As bread satisfies physical hunger. Jesus is letting you know that he can satisfy a spiritual hunger, a deeper hunger that cannot be satisfied anywhere else. Number two, Jesus said this. He said, I am the light of the world in an increasingly dark world, in a world where it's confusing. It's hard to know truth. It's hard to understand what's happening. You can't believe these things are happening. In a world where you can't seem to see straight, Jesus says he is the light to help you see and navigate. Number three, Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. The gate for the sheep was the thing that prevented predators from attacking the sheep. Jesus is saying, there is a safe place for you in my home. There is a safe place for you in my community. I am the one that can protect you. I am the one that can keep you safe. I am the gate for my sheep. Number four, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you thought you were dead in your sins, though you thought you were dead in your mistakes, though you thought your life couldn't change, Jesus says, no, 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 I am the one who conquered death. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Through me, I can give you new life. Number six, five, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. In Jesus, you are well cared for. You are watched over. He is trustworthy and true to love and to honor and to protect you because he's a good shepherd. Number six, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the source for your direction. Jesus is the truth for your life, and he is the place you get true life. And number seven, Jesus said this, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. When you commit yourself to Jesus, you're actually committing to stay connected to Jesus. And just as branches from the vine, the vine can't grow if they don't stay attached to the, to the source, we can't grow. We stop producing fruit and things happen. And for many of us, you might even call yourself a born-again Christian. You might even go to church on a Sunday. 
but you're not connected to the vine. And you're losing your source of power, of hope, of life transformation. Your body and your life is not going to produce the same fruit when you're disconnected from the vine. And so you have to be connected to produce the fruit that God created you to produce. Maybe today you're similar to Nicodemus. Maybe today you're searching, you're working, you're doing everything you can. Might look differently in your life than his life. Might look differently in your life than the person next to you, but the truth is we're all searching, we're all working, we're going for a goal, we're trying to pursue something. And at the end of the day, what happened in my life is everything I tried, it just didn't work out the way I thought. There was still something missing because the most important thing, there's nothing wrong with working hard. There's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with having good relationships or doing this or helping others. All those things are good. But the most important thing, the most important thing is that you're born again, is that you know who Jesus is and you've accepted him into your heart and you're forgiven for your sins because there's no other way it could happen, not by good works, not by saying a lot of prayers, not by giving a lot of money. It's only through Jesus and that God sent his son Jesus to die for us so we can be forgiven. And so this morning, we're going to sing a very beautiful song in just a moment, a very repentive, gorgeous song just to think about. But before we do that, I think there's a few people, whether you're here in person or whether you're watching online, I think there's a few people here who it's time to make the decision to turn to Jesus, to become born again, to be given new life. And so I'm just going to ask every eye closed, every head bowed, you're watching online, I'm speaking to you too. If this is you right now, if you say, listen, I need to give my life to Jesus. I've been searching, I've been looking, I've heard of Jesus, I might even been to church, I might even call myself a Christian, but I haven't fully given my life to Jesus. Now is the time, the Bible says it like this, when you confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you're forgiven of your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sins and that's what we do when we say a prayer. It's just starting the process of you confessing it with your mouth and if you believe in your heart, you're forgiven. You could just say a prayer simply like this. Say, God, I admit I'm not perfect. If this is you right now, if you need to receive Jesus, you could say a prayer like this. Say, God, I admit I'm not perfect. I know I've made mistakes and Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I know the only way I could be forgiven is that Jesus died on a cross And three days later, rose again. And he paid the price for my sins. Lord, thank you for my forgiveness. Thank you that you want me, that you love me. And that when I believe in Jesus, I'm adopted into your family. Lord, thank you, I'm forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed a prayer like that, the truth of the matter is if you believed it in your hearts, Jesus has forgiven you of all of your sins. What I want to do is just invite you to stand up with us as we begin to sing this song and maybe God will begin to speak to some of you. Maybe some of you who just prayed that prayer for the first time and maybe others who you'd say, I'm a Christian, but I'm missing something. I'm missing the most important thing, spending time with Jesus, being connected to the vine. And as we sing this song, I'm just going to pray that God begins to speak to some of you.